Hi, I'm Dr. Meredith Warner. For those of you who are not familiar with me or don't come to my practice already, and I am the owner of Warner Orthopedics and Wellness. And I'm gonna talk about bunions today. This is part of an ongoing series that we're doing of education uh, in the whole world of wellness and health. <clears throat> and so we sort of go topic by topic. Today's topic is bunions. We talked about facial fillers and Botox last time because that was a topic people were interested in. And if you have an interest, please let us know and I can make a talk around really any topic in healthcare. Um, so again, Warner Orthopedics and Wellness. I'm the founder, Dr. Warner. And this is my partner. He's a podiatrist, Dr. Kyle Lindo, and he's very highly trained, awesome guy. I just love him to death. Um, he's fun to work with, super smart, and he's here to help out to taking care of the community and patients. We have another partner, Dr. Anderson, who is physical medicine and rehab, and she's actually a highly trained acu acupuncturist and is treating a lot of my patients for chronic pain issues uh, with that methodology, which is you know non-narcotic and non-addictive, very safe, very effective, which is my goal. So what you're going to find here, and I've sort of briefly alluded to it, is kind of total wellness. I, I, I kind of think of myself as a wellness advisor, almost like you have a financial advisor. I'd like to be your wellness advisor. I'm a surgeon by trade and training, of course, so I love operating. But over the years and over my life, I've developed a love of health, wellness, nutrition, just sort of feeling good and being good and being part of this earth present in your life, part of your family, having vitality and aging optimally. And I'm getting to the point in my life where I have to start thinking about aging too. And I just, I hope to live into, you know, 150 years old and I hope to be doing yoga then. So I strive to do that for myself and my family and I'm bringing it to the community and my patients. Uh, this is our new building and this is what I just talked about, purpose built for functional fitness, health, wellness, vitality. I designed it to sort of have a general feeling of cleanliness, wellness, neat lines, sort of simplicity, declutter your life. We have a beautiful gym that serves also as my yoga studio and we're starting a yoga program. We have a massage therapist. We have the acupuncturist as I spoke about. I have a highly trained injector, an esthetician to bring that side of wellness um, to our sort of offerings. I got my partner, Dr. Kyle Lindo, and uh, we just hope to give you everything you need to live your best life and to have vitality and optimal aging. And sort of, if you're an athlete, to perform your best, to recover your best. If you're a teacher, so your feet don't get tired, you know, in the last period of your lessons. If you work in a plant, we want you to be able to fight back against all those environmental toxins that you get exposed to every day. If you have sleep cycle schedules with your work, we wanna teach you how to combat the effects of that. Uh, we're all about just making you better. And a part of that is surgical, of course, which we offer that. So today's topic is bunions. This is kind of our number one request at the moment. So I'm gonna talk about bunions and let's get into it. Oh, this is the healing soul. I invented this, a lot of you know this already, but this is a patented shoe uh, that treats heel pain, foot pain, particularly forefoot pain and heel pain. Uh, we have a new version that I designed specifically for people with great toe pathology like bunions or hallux rigidus or hallux limitus. You may have heard of these things. Um, the traditional healing sole has this little eight millimeter ramp. Uh, I eliminated that in the new version, the palmer, for people with bunions and people that have second and toes and first toes that cross or that touch too much so that you don't have that to impede the wear so that the other features of the shoe can treat your foot pain. We're gonna give a palmer away to um, someone selected from the group of people that are inclined to educate their peers. So if you share this talk with friends and family, you'll be entered into the contest automatically. So let's get into it. What are bunions? So bunions are the bony bumps at the forefoot. So let's just quickly break this down. When we talk about feet, we talk about hind foot, midfoot, forefoot, and then of course ankle. So today's topic is forefoot. So the bunion is typically here. It's on the medial side or the inside aspect of the forefoot of the great toe. It's at the metatarsophalangeal joint. This is a metatarsal, this is a phalanx. And so we call this the metatarsophalangeal joint where these two bones meet and form a joint. What happens is the toe deviates and you get sort of a bony prominence on this side or on the inside of the foot if you're looking down at it from a standing height. They can be painful to touch. They can range in size from tiny, and we measure it by angles, but clinically, if you look at it, it can be small, it can be enormous. You can have a crossover toe, you can have calluses, you can start to get flexion deformities of the other toes. Um, 
typically my patients is in adults, but these are congenital or hereditary in nature. And there are a lot of children that suffer with these. Um, I try to avoid surgery in children if at all possible. And there's a lot of non-operative ways to treat bunions. We'll talk about those. Um, every now and then a child, and what I'm talking about is before the growth plates close. Every now and then you have to address it surgically before the growth plates close, but usually you do not. And I really try to avoid surgery in children because growth just changes your outcomes too much. Bunionettes or Taylor's bunion are on the fifth toe. So some people have both and it makes the foot quite wide and makes shoe wear very difficult. So basically it's a deformity that is painful. And that's what we're gonna talk about today, the bunion. Okay, so why are they called bunions? That is Latin for turnip. And I took the um, luxury of putting a picture of a turnip here. I'm not sure why people decided to call it that back in the day, but I guess they thought it looked more like a turnip than anything else. Now, most of us do not eat turnips anymore and are not familiar with them. That's why I gave you a picture. What causes them? Well, you can have a bursitis around the bunion. You can have ganglion cysts. You can have, um, it can be from a true deformity, which is hallux valgus, which means the toe goes to the valgus side or towards the outside. A bunion can be formed from arthritic changes around this joint. Sometimes that's called hallux rigidus, and that's when the big toe hardly moves, or when you push off and it's massively painful because you're hitting one spur against another spur. Sometimes it can be from trauma, fractures, or bone breaks, or deformities. And again, a lot of them are hereditary. So this is an image showing you hallux valgus. So this is what we look at as surgeons. We'll measure this angle on some other angles and look at a couple other um, aspects of the radiograph and base our treatment on that. I'm going to talk about that briefly. But if you look, there's a long blue line that's measuring down the metatarsal. There's another blue line measuring down the phalanx on this slide. That angle between the two is what we measure. And a lot of times we can base our treatment off of the size of that angular deformity. Now, it's not that simple, of course. You have to take into account patient factors, lifestyle, activity levels, healing capacity, um, shoe wear needs for work, things like that. So there's a lot of different variables, but in a nutshell, it is this deviation, the hallux valgus angle event that we look at. And remember a little bit of a turn is normal, up to 15 degrees. So nobody really wants a fully straight toe like that. That actually in a lot of people is abnormal. So a slight deviation is normal. And what we strive to do is get that balance just right. So the intermetatarsal angle, this is another angle we look at, intermetatarsal. So the angle between two metatarsal bones, the first and the second specifically. And normal should be somewhere between nine to 12 or so. Again, you should have a little bit of a deviation. It shouldn't be perfectly parallel, but we try to get it closer to parallel when we're fixing this. Um, and that's another thing we look at. So your deformity you see is here, but it can be problematic anywhere along the course of the bones and the foot and including the soft tissue. And we're gonna get into that too. So again, why do we care about these angles? Why do we spend time measuring them on the x-ray and discussing them? Because the treatment varies based on that angle. And I put this sort of, um, picture of a football play to show you kind of what goes on in our head. It's an algorithm that we run through, Dr. Lindo and I, when we're looking at x-rays and we're looking at a patient, we kind of run through all of the possible treatment options and you sort of end up falling into what we think is optimized for you to give you your best outcome. So, and this is what this picture shows you. And this is actually an algorithm from a paper, one of the scientific papers that we read all the time. Um, Dr. Lindo and I actually host journal clubs for other professionals in the foot and ankle surgery world, physical therapists and um, other professionals to make sure we're on top of our game and staying cutting edge. And this is from one of those articles. This is a treatment algorithm starting with, do you have hallux valgus at the top? And then is the joint congruent, meaning does it match up or is the toe slid off the joint? Uh, if it's incongruent, then you go down and you measure the angles, the IMA hallux, and the hallux valgus angle. And then based off of that, you pick different surgical procedures. And of course, what this algorithm doesn't show you is you need to look at things like, is a patient obese? Does a patient run? Is the patient um, heavily active at work? Do they have osteoporosis? Do they have some other reason they might not heal quickly? Do they have to wear certain shoes at work, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the algorithm is actually even more complicated than the one you're looking at here. And the, uh, the reason that's important and important to emphasize to you is you're gonna find over time, as you go see physicians about your bunions, you will probably get 
a hundred different answers for the same foot. And there's a reason for that. There's over 130 described bunion procedures. So imagine that, that's what we have to go through in our heads. And obviously we're all different, nobody's perfect. We're gonna all have different opinions and different ideas. Um, and we've talked about second opinions before and we can talk about that later, but it's probably always a good idea for you to get those. So different patients have different treatments. And this is showing you that on these radiographs. So the one on the right side shows you somebody that came to me that had a, um, they had had a joint replacement in the great toe and it sort of deviated, it got a little bit loose over time. So that person's gonna have a completely different surgery than the person on the left side who had had a previous tibia fracture. You can see that metal rod that's going down their um, shin bone. And then they had a lot of arthritic change with flexion deformities on the other side. So you can see that the person on the left might need a different surgery than the person on the right. And that's our job and that's what we do for you. So again, what causes them? Uh, rheumatoid arthritis, that's an inflammatory arthritis. And what that means is you're autoimmune. So the joint capsule, every joint has, I, I tell people it's like a water balloon around the joint and it holds the joint fluid in, lubricates it to let it move. Well, people with things like lupus and gout and rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, that water balloon actually produces its own damaging inflammatory cytokines and it'll actually cause deformities and pain in the joint. So if you have an inflammatory arthritic condition, that in and of itself, you have to treat those in a specific way to combat both the bunion and the deformity as well as the arthritic condition. Genetics is probably the number one cause of bunions. So a lot of people are gonna tell you it's your shoes, it's your high heels, it's what you're wearing, it's what you do. It's not your fault. If somebody in your family had bunions, odds are you're gonna get bunions. Um, we uh, now are learning more and more on a daily basis about the genetic nature of medicine. And I can assure you, your bunions are probably genetic. Poor foot structure, that just, again, is a genetic thing. Some people are just inclined to have more flexible feet. They have connective tissue that is a little bit more elastic, and that will lead to bunions versus people that have more solid connective tissue. Trauma can cause bunions. Some people, like if you, let's say you fell and you landed right on your toe and your toe did this number and you ripped the tissue here and it never fully healed, well, that'll let it sling over over time. So I have seen traumatic bunions and those need to be addressed a little bit differently and they're, they're a little bit more difficult, uh, difficult to correct. Um, muscle imbalances, so you might have some contractures of the adductor tendon. I think I got a picture of that coming up versus laxity of the abductor tendon. There's a bunch of different muscles that are at play in the foot. And the thing to remember about the foot is the forces on the foot are six to 10 times body weight. It's a tremendous amount of force that's going on this joint every single day, all day long. Um, so you can imagine that's a lot for your muscles to fight. And then the last thing, I put a question mark because everybody thinks it's the footwear. What I think is the footwear makes you notice it. So you might have a bunion, but if you wear nice, beautiful ultra running shoes that are wide or you run around barefoot or you only wear flip flops, that bunion is probably never gonna bother you. But if you're trying to wear Jimmy Choo's or Manola Blahniks and you're running around in a four inch stiletto, you might notice your bunion. So I don't think the high heels cause it so much as make it more apparent. So this, yeah, I want to just briefly talk about this. I put this slide in just for uh, sort of educational purposes. These are all images of Chinese foot binding, which actually, believe it or not, is still practiced in some parts of the world. So if your foot is bound during the growth phases while the growth plates are still open, yes, you can cause deformity iatrogenically or by yourself, like a shoe could cause deformity. But generally in modern cultures where we don't bind feet before the growth plates are closed, a bunion is gonna be caused by genetics or trauma, things like that. It's not gonna be from your footwear. So what do they feel like? So some people have no pain. Some people have severe pain. Pain is very subjective and is very variable. So some people feel the pain here at the ball of the foot. Some people will actually feel the pain here at underneath the second and the third toe at the ball of the foot and not so much at the bunion because when you have a bunion, it makes the medial column of the foot a little bit lax and incompetent. And a lot of people end up loading their body weight on these two toes and they'll actually feel the pain here. We call that transfer metatarsalgia or just moving the metatarsal pain over. Uh, you can have redness, you can have sensitivity. Some people just have a burning pain right along this zone of the foot and that's because there's a nerve that runs right over the bunion called the dorsal medial cutaneous nerve and that can just be pressed all day long in your shoes and you'll get like this weird burning pain that doesn't really make a lot of sense. Uh, so it's really kind of caused by the bunion. 
it can become stiff, it can be painful to move. And one of the worst problems with bunions, I think, is it will biomechanically change how you function. So it'll change how you walk, how you run, and then that affects everything from the ankle up to the hip, and even through fascial line connections or spiral lines through the body, you can get shoulder pain from a very damaged gait pattern caused by a bunion, believe it or not. Next. So when should you come talk to somebody like me in a white coat? Um, hopefully never, but if you get to that point, it, it's when you notice that you're walking funny, you're wearing your shoes out differently, you're getting odd pains up and down the leg that don't make a lot of sense to you, um, you're getting calluses, or obviously when the bunion hurts a ton itself. When you've, you've tried to stretch it yourself, you've tried buying different shoes, nothing seems to be working. At that point, you might want to seek professional advice uh, because there's a lot we can do for you uh, short of surgery. But if you need surgery, obviously we love doing these surgeries and we're here for that as well. So are your shoes too tight or too tall? We talked about this before. This is actually an x-ray of somebody in a high heel. Now that's a probably four inch stiletto. You can wear up to like, I don't know, an inch and a half, two inches and probably never notice it, per particularly if it's a platform kind of a shoe. But obviously on a shoe like this, you can see that the toe is like this. So any given deformity of this joint, if you put it under that extreme of flexion and then you put body weight on it too, it might hurt a little bit. So again, it's not the shoe causing it, it makes you notice it because there's a positive family history in up to 94% of patients with bunions. And not everybody that wears a high heel gets a bunion, right? And not everyone that gets a bunion wears high heels. So it's correlated, but not causative. Just like gray hair is correlated with back pain, right? But not caused by back pain. And likewise, the fundamental cause is aging and genetics of both. How do we treat these? So what we'll do is take an x-ray. We already explained why. We measure certain angles. We look at certain load uh, characteristics of the foot and how it responds to weight bearing. Um, and then we'll do a clinical exam. We'll see which muscles are tight, which are loose. We'll check your ankle. We'll check your hips because believe it or not, hip range of motion, hip stiffness and strength plays into how your heel strikes the ground and how you walk. And a lot of times we can tweak bunion pain by making your gait a little bit more smooth and powerful by treating what I call the kinetic chain all the way up and down the leg. Um, the end of the day, we may say, yeah, you actually need surgery. And at that point, we either do a fusion, connecting this bone to this bone if it's severely arthritic. We do a realignment surgery. We might just do some soft tissue re reconstructions. And I showed you that algorithm so you know that it's very variable, heavily dependent on you, your characteristics, and what your x-rays look like in your clinical exam. You can take pain medicines. I'm not a fan of narcotics in any way, shape, or form. Um, I'll use them if I have to postoperatively, but there's much better ways to treat pain. Um, anti-inflammatories, I'm a big fan of natural treatments of pain, natural anti-inflammatories. They're very powerful and not talked about enough. Um, very safe. They don't damage your gut. They don't kill your gut biome. They don't attack your kidney um, and your liver. So that's another alternative. You can do alternating cold and heat. You can do things like stretching, toe yoga, contracture releases. So sort of fascial oriented massage techniques that will actually release the tight fascia that's drawing the toe over. And you can do therapeutic techniques to strengthen the muscles that hold the toe this way. Um, and that goes down to deep tissue fascial releases, dry needling, things that the physical therapists are awesome at. Um, you can actually do Botox to paralyze the muscles that are bringing this toe over. And I've done that for um, high level athletes that really can't have surgery. They can't afford to have a change in their foot structure. So we just paralyze a couple little muscles that bring the toe over and then tape them. And then people can go on to play football and soccer and things like that. Um, and then taping and bracing techniques. So there's a million ways to treat a bunion and not all of it's surgical. So athletes and bunion pain, we just alluded to this. Again, I told you about the weight bearing forces on the foot, particularly when you're running 10 to 12 times body weight in some cases. So tremendous force here. And you could just beat this joint up in, in ways you can't even imagine. And that a lot of athletes, a lot of runners will get what's called hallux rigidus or arthritic bunions based on this uh, joint from those forces. The increasing demands of people that have push off strength and running and uh, pivoting sports changes your treatment. So sometimes I might err really heavily on the side of non-operative, like I said, to not change performance. But if you need to have surgery, you wanna make sure you keep the working lengths of the bones all the same. You wanna minimize the recovery time. Uh, you wanna utilize as many soft tissue um, 
reconstructions as you can without uh, doing too many bony changes. And you certainly want to avoid fusing any joints for athletes and high level um, workers. Um, but I put a slide on here of the old New Orleans kicker who was able to achieve his job with a foot amputation. So where there's a will, there's a way, and we can work with you and get you to your goals. Okay, so there was a question um, online of what are some natural anti-inflammatories that I like. Um, Omega-3 fatty acids are extremely anti-inflammatory, and that's because the fatty acids are the basis of a whole um, system in the body that sort of balances and reduces the immune response to things, so it modulates inflammation. One of the other fatty acids that's important is anandamide, and anandamide is kicked up by CBD, so CBD is a great way to treat pain. If you take CBD, it'll actually kick up the fatty acid anandamide's amount in your body, and that helps the endocannabinoid system reduce inflammation. Another one is palmitoyl ethanolamide, which is in the same family as anandamide, and that is PEA, and we have some supplements with PEA at the Well Theory. Um, that's been used in Europe for years and years and years to treat pain. It's an awesome natural anti-inflammatory. I personally take tart cherry extract every single day, a thousand milligrams. Now I don't have bunions and I don't have pain right now, thankfully, um, but I've been taking this for, gosh, number of years now. And I can tell you, I take a synthetic anti-inflammatory maybe once a year now, whereas I used to take them once a week, maybe a little bit more just for minor aches and pains. But just being on omega-3 fatty acids, basic vitamins, tart cherry extract, taking CBD in extreme cases of pain, that's enough. Um, Turmeric is great, bromelain, which is extracted from pineapple, awesome anti-inflammatories. The list goes on and on, but those are probably my favorites. And resveratrol, which is of course in red wine, you guys have probably all heard about, hugely antioxidant and anti-inflammatory. So, well, there's a question about what oils to rub. Oh. Okay, this is a question is, am I talking about oral or topical? Um, I was talking about oral anti-inflammatories, like pills you would take to upregulate the immune system in your own body and help your body fight pain. There are a lot of topicals and you can put those in topicals too. Um, with the topicals, we just like to make sure there's a good way to drive it through the stratum corneum. That's the outer layer of the skin, the skin barrier, which in and of itself has an immune function. Uh, once you get it through the skin, it'll hit peripheral nerve receptors and downregulate the inflammatory response there. So they will work topically as well. Oh. I'm got, the questions are throwing my game. That's okay. You can get all of this. The Healing Soul, we have some topical anti-inflammatories and we have the PEA Multi, which is awesome for your immune function, um, your innate immune system in particular, as well as your acquired immune system. It has vitamin C, D3, magnesium, zinc, and then the PEA. And then there's the topical products as well that do have turmeric and the menthols to drive it through the skin and different essential oils to reduce inflammation, such as allspice and frankincense peppermint, wintergreen, these things are all just amazing things that are on this planet and plant form that I think we ignore in medicine. And I, I think they're awesome. The Well Theory has all of this as well, thewelltheory.com, thehealingsoul.com. Um, so those are good sources. And it's all heavily vetted, made in America, tested, third party tested, no heavy metals, no pesticides. And I designed every single formulation myself based on my years and years of research. And I take them all myself and my family take them all. Oh, that was, re I, 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 thanks, Rebecca. thanks Rebecca for the question. I don't want to shout out. All right, moving on in my talk. So simple modifications. So I put this picture in to show you a couple taping techniques. And our therapists are really awesome at this. It's, uh, KT taping is one technique, just basic taping. So people forget about tape. It's so easy and it so works so well. So for instance, a lot of marathoners will get like a hammer toe and they'll rub on the top of their shoe. You know, let's say you're 26 miles in the marathon. I mean, you could really rub this down to the bone and like have a real injury. Well, what do they do? You just put a couple strips of tape and then a few circumferential and you sort of put a guard around your toe. So people forget this methodology. The taping techniques I'm showing here really just kind of pull the toe over. So people with bunions who aren't quite ready for surgery, don't really need surgery, but they notice the pain when they're active, I tell them just tape 
tape your foot up and here's how to do it and go for a run and you should be fine and most of them are. So simple modifications if you're an athlete or you're on your feet all day at work can really help and um, keep you out of the doctor's office. So we just talked about this extensively about the natural pain relief and the picture on the left is the shoe uh, that I designed that treats foot pain and there's a bunch of um, reasons it works and synergistic methodologies within it but that's some of this talk about is about. And then the right side shows the well theory products, which are all based on uh, evidence backed science as to what works in the natural medicine realm uh, to help you treat your pain naturally and in a healthy way with minimal to no side effects, as opposed to all of the synthetic chemicals that we prescribe. So muscle balancing, let's talk about that. So the middle picture shows you that muscle I've been talking about, the one that we'll hit with Botox sometimes called the adductor, which is alpha delta delta adductor. And that adductor muscle pulls the toe this way. The abductor alpha bravo delta will pull the toe this way. And that is a balancing muscle. It's sort of the big thick muscle you see on the top of your instep. It actually starts back here on the calcaneus, goes along the bottom of the foot or the side of the foot and the instep and attaches here. And that is your push off balancing muscle. So if you can strengthen that muscle and stretch the adductor, you could self treat a bunion. Um, and this is just showing a technique using strapping, which is sort of the Iyengar method, method of yoga to sort of help achieve a position. Um, to sort of stretch that adductor. And then there's different techniques that the therapist can show you to strengthen the abductor. And then remember, all of these muscles have interconnections to other muscles in the leg and the foot. So for instance, this big toe bone will actually, if you work it out enough, you'll actually feel it up the outside of your leg because one of the muscles on the outside of the leg actually attaches to the base of this bone. And so there's a lot of different inner workings along the kinetic chain that we take into account when we sort of design a muscle balancing program for you or a functional fitness program for you. But you can do techniques like that and you can achieve your goals in bunion treatment because sometimes you really just need to move this over a couple of degrees to not have any more pain. So Botox, we talked about dry needling. The pictures on the right are showing a dry needling in the intrinsic muscles. And the, um, the, the one that's sort of on the bottom there is near the tendinous insertion of the abductor. And the two needles on the top in the web space are more likely than not sitting within the adductor. And dry needling is simply teensy tiny needles that you can barely feel going in. Uh, they're the same size needles that our acupuncturists use, but this is a different treatment methodology just the same tool, if you will. So dry needling will go in and actually do deep, deep tissue massage in those two muscles that are pictured on the left in the primal anatomic an, uh, animations there. So it's picture on the right, the animation is the abductor hallucis and the one on the left is the adductor. And those are the main muscles that are pulling the phalanx back and forth that we're talking about. So again, remember I spoke to you earlier about the dorsal medial cutaneous nerve. Sometimes that is the only reason you have pain. And sometimes we can just sort of release adhesions around that nerve with either some deep tissue techniques or dry needling. Sometimes I'll block it with uh, liquid ibuprofen or different um, numbing medicines like lidocaine or bupivacaine. Um, and sometimes we actually just need to do a little tiny minor surgery to remove a bump of bone that's pushing on that nerve. Um, so sometimes, your bunion pain might not really be the bunion, it's the indirectly the bunion, but it's really the nerve. And we can sort of tease that out when we examine you. So these are some other alternative treatment methodologies. Reflexology, which is sort of um, Eastern medicine or Asian medicine sort of massage technique. Massage in and of itself is an amazing way to treat bunion pain and to also relax the muscles and give you a better chance of sort of self-treating. Um, we have a massage therapist who can help you with this as well. And then deep tissue massage like Graston or ASTEM, which our physical therapists do. And then dry needling, I sort of think of it as like targeted massage, whereas um, the deep tissue massage is more like blanketed. Um, I always think in military ways. So I think of regular massage as sort of cluster bombing and then dry needling like targeted um, high-tech bombing, if you will. So you can get right to the muscle you want to hit specifically with the dry needling. And the bigger type massage treats the fascial trains and all of the interconnections and sort of the broad way the body connects to itself. And then acupuncture will treat pain. Now, acupuncture doesn't treat deformity. The massage techniques and the fascial releases can actually 
help you to release the deformity, if you will. <clears throat> acupuncture uses a system, and I'm not the expert in acupuncture, Dr. Anderson is, but acupuncture uses the system of meridians or sort of regions of the body and the way the energy flows. So you can treat foot pain by doing acupuncture somewhere else in the body and just changing the flows of energy. Um, and it, it's highly effective. And we even use acupuncture in the veteran system and in the military. So it is not voodoo. It actually works very, very well. And the techniques have some scientific soundness to them. Surgical treatment. So of course, I'm a surgeon. So you knew I was going to have to talk about this at some point. Occasionally, rarely, non-operative treatment will fail. But, and when it fails, uh, we have a treatment for that. We have a plan B, if you will. So the first thing is to remember uh, you got to plan for the recovery. So you need to make sure you got help. You need to make sure your house doesn't have loose rugs on the floor or things that are to make you trip up if you're on crutches. So you got to think all that through. You got to get planned with work. You got to make sure you got a little disability policy if you're going to be off for a certain amount of time. Things like that. Driving, if it's your right foot, you're not going to be driving right away. So we always try to get people um, logistically ready to have surgery because it changes your outcome. If you're well prepared and you're not stressed, you're going to have a better outcome. Um, so when your activities and your work allows and when you're through all of your special trips and things that are going on and you don't have any reason to stress during your recovery, that's the best time to have the surgery. And then, of course, we're going to go through our algorithms. We'll examine you. We'll talk to you to get a feel for what your goals are and what your lifestyle's like. We will take x-rays. We'll measure them. Occasionally, we need to get advanced imaging like MRIs and CT scans. Um, and then based on all of those inputs as data, if you will, we will decide what surgery works best for you. And then we'll talk about it with you. OK. I, um, I have a real love right now for minimally invasive surgeries. This is something that we've uh, developed over the past couple years. The technology is now allowing us to do this. Um, so what this means is through very tiny, tiny punch holes, I call them, maybe about an eighth of an inch big, I can insert a percutaneous cutting device, percutaneous meaning through the skin. Um, and then you, I use live x-rays during surgery, so I have to wear lead the whole time. And I can actually do the bone cuts that I need to do and move the bone around to where I want it uh, through these tiny, tiny incisions. And what that does for you, not only does it reduce the scar, and there's almost no scar, but it actually, because you're not making a big incision and a big dissection, it actually shortens the time to recovery because what you need to heal is blood and blood flow, and those dissections disrupt the teensy tiny blood vessels of capillaries. Your body has to rebuild those before it can even begin to heal you. So by minimally invasive surgery, we don't disrupt any of that, what we call the biologic envelope. And then that lets you heal so much quicker. I've had people after minimally invasive bone cuts be able to weight bear within a week. Um, so it's been pretty awesome. Sometimes I'll want to put a pin to sort of train the bone in the direction I want it to go while it's healing. But generally speaking, um, I try to do this without hardware, if at all possible, so that at the end of the day, when you're done, when you're healed, you don't have any foreign metal in your body and your bones are where you want them and you've healed quickly and you hardly have a scar. So that's sort of where I've gone in my evolution, but this isn't for everybody. And sometimes the deformities are too big. Sometimes it's too much of a revision case. Sometimes there's too much arthritis. Um, but if at all possible, I'll do this for you. Um, the funny thing about minimally invasive surgery is because you're not putting the hardware in and you're not putting the bones exactly perfectly where you want them, you're doing more of, you're making the foot look good and not the x-ray look good. Sometimes the x-rays look a little goofy for a while, um, but the foot always looks awesome and the recovery is so fast. Um, I mean, and the, the swelling goes down quicker, the pain goes away quicker. These are some x-rays from minimally invasive procedures. Now, the one on the top left is with hardware, but you can see how... The, um, the metatarsal is over, but the bone cut was here, and this whole part of the toe was shifted over. And then a screw is sort of going almost through empty space from one side of the bone into the other one. That's one minimally invasive technique, and you get a better idea of that with the intraoperative x-ray on the bottom left, showing you how the bone is completely displaced and just held by those two little screws. But that heals very quickly and very reliably because you have not disturbed the biologic envelope. Um, I like to do more on the right side with the wires, the pins, because I can pull those out and leave you with no hardware. And then you can see the scar. There, where's the scar? There's really hardly any scar with this technique. So that's been a lot of fun and gratifying for me to be able to do this for people to correct their deformity with minimal or no scar. 
But again, I can't do it for everybody. Everybody's different and you saw that algorithm, but if it's possible, we'll do it this way. So these are treatments I don't usually recommend and I just put this on to be sort of funny. Um, if you look on that picture on the left, that's actually a heel sticking up. So somebody's actually wearing that shoe backwards and leaning forward to the left of the picture. That device in the middle is actually an actual device that helps people achieve the needed ankle range of motion to dance on point. And then the one on the right are tabby shoes that are priced at $895 if you're looking for a pair. So in a nutshell, that's bunions. So you understand the complexity of bunions. Everybody thinks, oh, it's just a bunion. Well, there's a little bit more that goes into it. Uh, you know that they're not all surgical. So you can treat them non-operatively and we can assist with that. Um, if you do need surgery, there's a thousand ways to skin a cat. We'll pick the best one for you, um, or at least give you some options. And then hopefully we can sort of act like it along the way, your wellness advisor, and kind of help you get as active as possible and improve your lifestyle and be able to engage better at work and with your friends and families, hopefully get off of synthetic chemical medicines. Hopefully we can help you achieve sort of whole body wellness. That's kind of my goal. Any questions? The, re the recovery times. Okay, recovery times are variable. So if you're doing a simple minimally invasive case, I expect that the patient will be weight bearing in a boot, maybe with a pin, okay? Let's say I put a pin in it. I'll let them walk in a boot at one week, 50% weight bearing, advance to full, to the second week and I'll leave the pin in two to three weeks. Um, and then you do a special taping technique or dressing technique to sort of hold the toe where you want it while it's healing. Cause of course the bone's not healed at three weeks. Um, around about five, six weeks, we start physical therapy to make sure you don't get stiff. Cause one of the biggest problem after bunion surgery besides recurrence of the bunion um, is stiffness. And that I try to fight that with physical therapy and that's been hugely successful. Um, so in general, you'll be walking 50% within a week, full weight bearing by three weeks, in therapy by four or five weeks, um, and then hopefully in a regular shoe when the swelling goes down somewhere around two months, you'll probably be able to go from a boot to sort of a surgical shoe within that second month. Again, everybody's different and it depends on how long you stand every day at work, things like that. Uh, the question was, do we have physical therapy? Yes. I'm a huge believer in physical therapy and non-operative treatment of problems, and I do it differently than anybody. Nobody has what I have in this building. I can walk across the hall and talk to my physical therapist, and we treat people together and coordinate all of the time. We're in the same building. You saw the gym. That is in my clinic. It's not in a separate part of the building. I interact with my physical therapist every day, all day. We discuss patients. We coordinate care, and we come up with working treatment plans together. Um, so yeah, they're in-house, and the yoga's in-house and the massage therapy is in-house uh, and the acupuncture is in-house as well. Yeah, so Dr. Anderson is the lady that does acupuncture and she's highly trained. She's actually trained in California um, with experts in the field and she is physical medicine and rehab. She's an MD. Her subspecialty is physical medicine and rehab. She actually... Uh, is probably the most skilled that I've seen uh, performing what are called electromyograms or nerve conduction studies. So I can pick up very subtle issues with nerve roots uh, in the spine all the way down to the foot. Same thing with carpal tunnel. She picks up a lot of carpal tunnel and then we can do carpal tunnel releases for people. Um, so she's highly skilled in finding out if a nerve is the source of your pain or if you have a muscle disorder. Um, and then in addition to that, she can do Botox for headaches and migraines. She's highly skilled in that. Botox for spasticity. Um, and then she does acupuncture, which is awesome. And, and she sort of, I think of her like a non-operative orthopedist. So she looks at the whole person and sort of how everything goes together, how you walk, what chairs you sit in, how your ergonomic workstation is set up, things like that. So she's been a great addition to our team to help give you your maximum outcomes in life.
So two questions sort of combined in one. The question was, does the healing soul prevent bunions? And does putting that wedge, sort of that silicone wedge that sits between the big toe and the second toe prevent bunions from getting worse? I would say that wedge between the two toes could potentially keep it from getting worse because it's not gonna let that toe drift, right? So for instance, a lot, I treat a lot of diabetics uh, with foot problems and many of them come to me having had the second toe amputated. Um, when that happens, they all get a bunion because they don't have anything stopping that big toe from sliding over. That's an extreme example. But yeah, sometimes just wearing that spacer is just enough pressure to keep that toe from drifting. The flip-flop is not gonna, there's nothing here to stop the toe from moving over. So I would say this is not gonna prevent a bunion deformity. It might make it feel better and treat the pain of it, but it's not gonna keep it from getting worse. All right. There's any other questions? If not, then this was an, a pleasure and maybe send us now we're gonna announce the winner of the contest, which means you're gonna get a pair of the Palmers. Um, and then also maybe try to, if you can, if you come to my office or even online, try to send us some topics you're interested in because I love giving talks and teaching um, and I'll teach on anything, back pain, neck pain, natural anti-inflammatories, whatever y'all wanna hear about. And next month, I'm talking about one of my favorite topics, which is biologic rejuvenation. And we're gonna talk about platelet-rich plasma, which is your blood that we process in such a way that we can harvest all of the body's natural growth factors and then targeted inject them where they need to go. So we use it for knee pain, arthritic conditions of the shoulder, ankle, what have you, for muscle tears, for tendon problems like Achilles tendonitis, things like that. You can put it um, topically to drive through the skin to help build the collagen layer underneath your skin. You can inject it in the face for facial rejuvenation because it basically just rebuilds collagen. But PRP is a wonderful addition to our tool chest as surgeons. And I'm going to talk about it next month. Oh, we have a tie. Rebecca Gardner and Vicki Gambrell. The tie, so I guess that means you both get a pair, which we're happy to do. And so thank you so much, everybody. And I hope to see you here for wellness, hopefully not for an injury or pain. But if you have that, please come on and we'll take very, very good care of you. We treat you like family here.